So I want to introduce our absolutely fantastic speaker for this evening, Professor Sam Seydoux. Professor Sam Seydoux is a professor at the University of Leicester. He's a professor in diabetes and cardiometabolic medicine. As well as that, he's the vice chair of research of primary care diabetes Europe. As well as that, he's a board member and associate editor for primary care diabetes society journal, as well as being a busy GP clinical lead for his integrated care system and also teaching undergraduates and is a GP trainer. So Sam's just supremely experienced and really ideally suited to give us information about diabetes and dementia because his research interests are in care of diabetes in elderly populations, ensuring that people receive the right diabetes treatments for their condition and also addressing health inequalities. Sam's a wonderful speaker, highly experienced, just really going to be fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to this evening's talk. So I'm going to hand over to you, Professor Sam Seydoux. Thank you, Sam. Hi, Arjun. Thank you so much for having me uh, join you uh, for today's discussion. Uh, so uh, my name is Sam Seydoux. I'm a clinical professor in diabetes and cardiometabolic medicine at the University of Leicester. Um, and I'm a practicing GP as well. So uh, the outline of our discussion today, Joan, should be to define what dementia is. And we will spend a bit of time to discuss the link between dementia and diabetes and the vice versa. And then uh, kind of explore the ethnic differences in people with diabetes and risk of uh, uh, dementia. And then the impact of the two conditions on the medications that they have to use uh, for uh, their their, their treatments and of course the impact of the combination of dementia and diabetes on not just the family or uh, the patient but the families and carers. It, will that be a good summary of our objectives Joan? Yeah Yeah. thanks Professor that is going to be excellent. Um, I think it's really key that we highlight some of these important issues and I think sometimes people don't even realise that there's a link between dementia and diabetes. So I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Fantastic. So uh, I think the first thing we need to do is basically understand what dementia actually is. Uh, so uh, I would say it is um, the chronic impairment of your memory and cognitive um, levels or your memory and your intellectual faculties, which uh, tend to dwindle uh, with time. And there are different types of dementia. Uh, you know, we've got Alzheimer's dementia, which is the vast majority of patients with dementia. But we do also have vascular dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia, uh, and so on and so forth. I think for the purpose of today's discussion, we're going to focus on Alzheimer's dementia, which is the more uh, commoner one. Um, it tends to start very late on, usually over the age of 65, but you can get early onset uh, Alzheimer's dementia starting before uh, the age of 50, which is typically uh, associated with some genetic predispositions. Uh, for the medics who are joining us, um, just to explain the pathology of the condition, uh, you do get something we call amyloid plaques, which get deposited in the brain uh, and lead to a lot of infl inflammation, uh, a lot of inflammatory process, which lead to the destroying or the destructions of some of the nerves, which are responsible for uh, memory in the brain. And that gradually leads to shrinkage of the brain substance and eventually leading to uh, dementia. Would you um, have any clarifications needed, uh, Joan, on this? So um, 
Thanks, Sam. Uh, yes, absolutely. Entirely agree. I think one of the things that um, people can sometimes confuse um, is that not all dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And I think sometimes these these terms are used interchangeably, aren't they? Yes. Um, but, you know, um, as you get older, um, your risk of having things like dementia can increase. Um, but sometimes we can sort of say, as you get older, you get grey hairs, but not everybody <laughs> with grey hair is older. Um, so it's a bit like dementia. Dementia is something that tends to come on as you get older, but not everybody who gets older will have dementia. And also remembering that dementia is this umbrella term. So Alzheimer's makes up the vast majority, but there's other types of vascular dementia, particularly if we're talking in the context of diabetes, is is particularly important as well. So um, it's it's really good to just remember that. Um, thanks, Sam. So the um, two types that you've mentioned already, you've mentioned Alzheimer's dementia and uh, vascular dementia in the context of diabetes. Both of these are increased in patients with diabetes. So if you've got um, diabetes, uh, studies have shown that you are 2 to 2.3 times more likely to get uh, vascular dementia and 1.6 um, times more likely to, to have um, Alzheimer's dementia. So diabetes uh, is associated with an increased risk of both of these types of dementia. Now, the pathogenesis or the way dementia comes about is actually very intricately linked to the way diabetes comes about. To the extent that there is now a, a medical term that is appearing in the literature that we call type 3 diabetes. And that has been suggested for those patients who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia while also showing the symptoms of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance basically means your body's inability to respond to the presence of insulin. So insulin is supposed to help you uh, process glucose uh, in your tissues. So some people will have a lot of insulin in their system, but that insulin is not able to process the, the glucose that is available. And this Pathology, pathological problem is has been found to be commonly associated with people with diabetes and Alzheimer's disease to the extent that the term type 3 diabetes has been coined uh, for, for these, stuff, these types of patients and it's typically uh, more prevalent in those over the age of 65. The association between diabetes and Alzheimer's starts from obesity. So people who are big are more likely to have insulin resistance. And when you develop your insulin resistance, that leads to all the changes, the development of the amyloid plaques, which I talked about, or tau tangles. And this lead to the inflammatory process that eventually leads to the destruction of the nerves, which eventually leads to a decrease in brain volume and neural networks. That whole process also leads to a decreased uptake of glucose in the brain. Remember, I've already said that insulin resistance is common between uh, Alzheimer's dementia and diabetes. So if you've got the insulin resistance in your brain, it means that the insulin does not get utilized in the brain. Uh, and that leads to dementia ultimately. You have mentioned um, those who are young, Joan, and those who are old over the age of 65. Now, the younger ones, uh, Alzheimer's, the presence of Alzheimer's disease tends to be associated with genetic predisposition. Uh, and if you have genetic predisposition uh, to Alzheimer's, your risk of developing Alzheimer's is two to three fold uh, increase. For those who have diabetes alone, their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease uh, rises to between 1.5 and 2 fold. But if you have diabetes and genetic predisposition, that risk can be as high as 10, 10 times higher. Uh, so so uh, thankfully, diabetes is not 
something that we cannot do anything about. Um, if age, you know, is associated with Alzheimer's disease, uh, you cannot do anything with your age. However, if you've got diabetes, you can do something about it. You cannot do anything about your genetic predisposition, but you can do something about your diabetes. So if the combination of genetics and diabetes increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's by tenfold, it makes sense that focusing on what you can do something about to bring that risk down is probably a better intervention for patients and healthcare professionals. That's really important, um, Sam. And thanks very much for highlighting that. I think people can sometimes get very nervous about the risk of developing dementia, stroke Alzheimer's disease, if it's in their family. And I think it's important that we highlight that this genetic risk that we're talking about is actually more prevalent in those people who develop dementia at a young age. And in that first slide, I think it was that you had, yeah. we had that young age being, you know, in the sort of 50s um, or certainly below 65 anyway. Um, so in that younger age group, the genetic risk predisposition is more likely to occur there. The one above 65 or the dementias above the age of 65 that gradually increase as you get older are not so much associated with a genetic risk. So I think some people can really worry if somebody has dementia in their family that they are going to inherit dementia. And, and I think we need to clarify that that isn't usually the case if it's one of those, the majority of dementias, which develops over the age of 65. So, and you've again highlighted another really important point about what you can do. If you're unfortunately at increased genetic risk, because somebody in your family's developed it at that young age, you can't really do very much about that. But type two diabetes, we know there's lots of things you can do about that to either try to prevent it occurring, to look after it well, and to put it into remission, possibly, as well. So, um, yeah, it's great to, to know that there's things that we can do. I think the interaction with, uh, between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease is in the angle of insulin resistance. That's the point I made initially. I talked about type 3 diabetes. So that interaction is the point at which we need to focus if we have to get effective interventions uh, to address the issue of dementia in people with type 2 diabetes. And like I said, if I cannot do anything about my, my genetic disposition, I should be able to do something about my diabetes. What can we do with diabetes? Well, there are two things that we tend to do to manage diabetes. One is lifestyle and the other is using treatment. And so all of these, these interventions should be focused on addressing the issue of insulin resistance. And that brings me to my next slide, Joan. So in this slide, I've got two points there that I'm gonna make. The first is the issue around physical activity and uh, walking. So this is a study that was recently presented in America where they looked at patients, um, you know, who had cognitive decline in diabetes, about over 100 of them, uh, followed up for a year, categorized into those who were sedentary uh, versus those who were active, and they examined the relationship between the exercise and their mood. And after the follow-up, what they found was that the active patients had attenuation in their uh, total uh, uh, cognitive uh, decline uh, and even significant improving, improvement in their mini, uh, mental state uh, uh, scores. And so what it tells me in this study is that that increased physical activity, as we know, increased physical activity is associated with improvement in insulin resistance or increases your insulin sensitivity. So it tells me that it actually takes us back to the pathophysiology, which I talked about, the insulin resistance, tie in dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, and type 2 diabetes. 
you get physically active, you improve your insulin sensitivity, and then you improve your, um, um, your, your cognitive decline. So that is one evidence-based intervention that we can do. The second thing that I'm going to talk about in this slide is the use of drugs. So this is not available yet, but supposing we use insulin, okay, in the brain, because there is insulin resistance, there's decreased utilization of insulin in the brain. So if I found a way of getting insulin directly into the brain, could I potentially improve cognition? So that's what this other study is about. Again, a very small study, over 100 patients with type 2 diabetes and cognitive decline uh, who were randomized, one group to get placebo and the other group to get inhaled insulin. This treatment is not available yet, but it's just testing that theory. So you inhale the insulin, and for those who are medics, uh, inhaling it through, uh, you know, their olfactory nerves, bypassing the blood-brain barrier, goes straight into the brain. They were able to demonstrate improved uh, delays in memory and preserve functional ability and general cognition. So there is, you know, some evidence to back this up. And I'm hoping that in the near future, we shall have this available as a treatment option if you have to use medications in addition to your lifestyle changes. But as you said previously, um, Sam, that we can use what we have available now. So the walking is really good news. Um, being active and as, as a way to improve the situation should you be experiencing things like cognitive decline, which is about your functioning, your thinking, your memory, all of those things, um, then it's really good to know that the walking is something that can, can really help. Mm -hmm.